So uh, this is uh, a talk about um, Staples Innovation Lab, but really it's about, uh, I think, the story of how Clojure helped us um, go from basically a two-person two startup to, um, you know, helping some of the largest e-commerce merchants do interesting things, and then being acquired by Staples. So uh, really quick, uh, my name is Amit Rathod. I've been using Clojure for a while, um, and uh, I've written the uh, Clojure in Action book. Um, as part of the founding team of this little startup, um, and now, um, thanks to the acquisition, I'm a VP at Staples, um, helping them do e-commerce stuff, and also run the innovation lab. So this story starts in uh, 2008, um, and uh, you know, e-commerce is a growing industry. It's growing by 20% a year um, of a three trillion dollar market retail market. It's about 200 billion dollars a year in size in the U.S. alone, um, but. Amazon is absolutely killing everybody in this space. Um, and conversion rates are really, really low. And that basically means, you know, if you're a merchant, 1% of the traffic that comes to your store ends up buying something. And most people, most merchants spend money to get traffic. They buy ads, they buy, you know, they spend on marketing campaigns. And 99% of these dollars are wasted. 99% of people that come to your site don't buy anything. And Retail 101 teaches, uh, many merchants how to solve this problem. You know, lots of them give away some form of price break in order to help people buy more. And of course, they leave money on the table, thanks to this, because this is a very old school way of doing things. It's a one size fits all, you lower your prices, everyone gets the same lowered price. You know, it's kind of what they had to do uh, for many, many years. Uh, but in the age of uh, big data today and personalization of everything, um, you know, you can figure out the individual's price sensitivity in real time. You can figure out where in the buying cycle they are. You can figure out what their exact purchase intent is. Um, so there is really no reason to do this uh, terribly, you know, non-discriminatory approach to uh, discounting. And so this is where Runa comes in. And you know, what we used to do uh, was to use this big data, apply some machine learning algorithms to it. Um, you know, predictive models that would then in real time, figure out what to, uh, what to do with individual shoppers when they're on the site, um, provide this as an API, essentially, and that's what would lead to profit, essentially. Um, so this is sort of early 2008. We were a Rails shop, um, and you know, sort of in the mid-2008 time frame, started here about Clojure. And you know, there's lots of things to like, obviously. Um, there was a Lisp, it was functional, it was in the JVM. Uh, so what's not to like? Um, but of course, there were, at that time, a lot of unknowns. Just no one was using it in production. Um, you know, who was this rich guy? Uh, things like that. Um, and then, of course, uh, Stu's book came out, and that made it production ready. Um, <laughs> so, so thank you for that. Um, and we were in production uh, with Clojure uh, later that year. I think we were probably one of the first few companies to do it. Um, and I remember still that you know, we used to, our build used to actually check out Clojure uh, and it was frozen at this particular, I don't know, tag or whatever they call it, uh, for a long time. And then in 2009, 2010, we continued to do this. We had a lot of success with it. A small team, we built many more services on top of you know, using that. 95% um, of our code base was and still is Clojure, uh, with some R and Python thrown in for the machine learning bits. So at this point, we were powering 350 small to medium uh, retailers. We had about uh, 500 requests per second load, uh, thousands of predictive models uh, being run in real time. And all of this was done with three engineers and one data scientist uh, running on a couple of servers. So again, uh, a huge testament uh, in my mind to Clojure. Pretty amazing results, 10 to 30% sales lifts, which incidentally translates to a much higher lift in profit. And if you're interested in how that works, we can chat about that offline. These are all incremental sales, so everything basically falls to the bottom line. Um, so, you know, it was great. And then the story basically continues. Uh, you know, a couple of years later, we have a bunch of large merchants. We were powering stuff for eBay, Groupon, Overstock, Target, and we were doing about 10,000 requests per second, over a million predictive models in real time, um, with six engineers and one data scientist, also running still on the same two servers. Um, Again, so now uh, in mid-2013, um, we started to work with Staples. Turns out it's the second largest e-commerce player in the world after Amazon. And 
that was an interesting opportunity. We were doing some good work for them. And then later that year, this year, last month, we got acquired. Uh, and Staples Innovation Lab was born. And uh, I mean, I, th I really have to thank everyone in the community, obviously Rich uh, and others, too, for all of this awesomeness. Um, so it was an end of era for us at, as Runa. And we've been around in the community for a, la for a while. So, you know, and, you know, Alice in Wonderland used to be our sort of uh, naming, everything was named after uh, stuff in there, so. But a start of an era, so I'll move over to uh, Hitchhiker's Guide, uh, as things should. Um, this is our logo, you know, sort of named it Zillion. And it's kind of a cycle that's starting again. This is early 2014 next year, and, you know, Amazon is still killing everyone, and it's much worse. The bloodbath is just ridiculous. And just to give you some sense, I mean, Walmart, uh, as a company, sold $480 billion worth of stuff last year. And the US economy, the GDP is 14 trillion. This is a huge number. And Amazon sold $150 billion. But here's the thing, Walmart's growing at 2%, Amazon's growing at 30%. I mean, this is what they're doing. And the reason they're doing that is because they're a technology company. And they know how to, and, they, and Jeff Bezos is, is a, comes from a hedge fund background, he's uh, you know, thinking long term. There's no way to compete with these guys. So that's where we fit in. Um, the idea is to continue what we kind of tried to do at Runa. Uh, just stay focused on some very small key things within the e-commerce landscape, um, and basically build out the, this next generation uh, set of services and platforms for, for Staples, and help them compete uh, in this Amazon world. Uh, they're already late, quite frankly, and uh, we have to now accelerate much more so than we would have had to do. So that's kind of where we're looking to Closure to help. Um, they're also doing a massive uh, product expansion, so they're going to go up broad, not just the 35,000 office products they sold. So what are we going to be doing? So lots of things that Amazon knows and has been doing really well. Um, dynamic pricing, all the recommendation stuff, uh, search, whole new search for uh, staples. So that's kind of the thing. Uh, they've done this for a long time. Our job is to you know, take that relevant bits of all the, f the learnings that they've had and sort of do it in a really compressed timeline you know, for a couple of years, basically. And the tools are obvious, um, and the people that you know, we want and that can do this are also quite obvious. I mean, we're going to build the biggest, baddest team of closure engineers and data scientists the world has ever seen. <laughs> uh, that's the plan. Um, we were about 15 people when we got acquired. We're about 25 right now. 50 people by Q1, I'd say. Um, 300 over the next two or three years. Uh, this will be the biggest, I hope the baddest, uh, closure team. And here's what we're up against. I mean, this is Amazon's stock chart over the last five years. Okay? Almost 10x. This is Staples over the same time period. A high to, of 26 to 15. So the only way to go is up. <laughs> this is an opportunity. And I think with the right people, with the right uh, you know, team, we can help you know, and participate in that upside. So, but again, make no mistake, you know, this is a ruthless, ruthless client, uh, you know, enemy. Um, and you know, traditional warfare has and will continue to fail against them. And so this is, again, an experiment this, that continues in the power of small teams. And uh, you know, 300 is not a very large number, if you think about it. And the way we're structuring that is multiple teams doing, uh, you know, small teams doing uh, interesting work, um, each of them doing like a service or two, um, interoperable APIs and all of that. And uh, that's kind of how we want to scale that, that human factor. This is, again, 300 people, small, pretty small team, and up against this badass uh, foe. And so uh, at this, this 300 people, I mean, you know, this kind of, <laughs> this is the 300. Um, but again, I'm not under any illusion because, you know, the Spartans all died. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, we may die too, right? I mean, this is, I mean, I've, startups are brutal. I've learned that, and this is like a startup, but God damn it, it's going to be one hell of a fight. So join us at this, uh, for this thing. Thank you. <laughs>Thanks, Matt. I'm, uh, I should also mention uh, again that uh, Staples Innovation Lab is a platinum sponsor of the conference, and uh, so we thank them for that, their commitment to the closure community. So thank you.
Yeah. Uh, next up, we're going to have uh, Marshall Bachrath Van, Gr Van de Grift talking about parkour, which is the closure Hadoop stuff. I'm sorry, I don't actually know that much about it. So, <laughs> so I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. Steve Miner, are you around here somewhere? Yeah. Oh, okay. You'll be up next. <laughs> yeah. They. Oh, there you go. Okay. All right. All right. This is Marshall. Okay, so I'm here to talk about Parkour, which is a library for writing MapReduce jobs in idiomatic closure. Uh, so my motivation uh, is primarily that uh, I think MapReduce is actually a really great paradigm for writing certain programs. Uh, if you need to do bulk data processing that is linearly scalable, then uh, MapReduce will get you there. Um, I also think MapReduce is actually an easy and comprehensible way of thinking about programs. Uh, a lot of uh, discussions of MapReduce talk about functions over individual key value tuples and gluing those together. But really, at least in Hadoop's implementation of MapReduce, you have uh, functions that are transformations over collections of tuples. Um, now, Clojure has a lot of really great functions for transforming collections, so what I'd like to do is write my MapReduce programs in Clojure. Now, if you were here two hours ago, at this point you're thinking, wait a minute, doesn't Cascalog already exist? Um, okay, so there's that, but uh, really, so Cascalog is great. Um, I have used and will continue to use Cascalog, but I would contend Cascalog is definitely not MapReduce. Uh, Cascalog is its own abstraction, which then, as we just saw two hours ago, uh, compiles to a number of different platforms, but using a paradigm which is distinct from MapReduce. There are things that you can do in MapReduce that are not easily expressed in Cascalog, and vice versa. And I think it's best to use the best tool for the job. So the primary thing that uh, Parkour provides is Hadoop integration. So I explicitly want to contrast this against wrappers. There's no like one-to-one, -one, here's a method in Hadoop, here's a function in Parkour. Um, and it's also not a framework. Um, parkour tries to go out of its way to avoid introducing new abstractions. The idea is to take the abstractions that are already in Hadoop and the abstractions that are in Clojure and bring them together so that they work harmoniously. Okay, so Parkour provides some basic stuff to do things like integrate Hadoop's I.O. with Clojure's I.O. So Hadoop has its own distributed file system. Using Parkour, you can use all the standard Clojure I.O. operations directly on things on the distributed file system. Um, there's some other low-level stuff, like um, Hadoop has these configuration mutable maps that we have some nice functions to access, um, but that's all pretty low-level stuff. More interestingly, when you're actually running a job, Hadoop uses named classes in order to implement what in you know, a functional language like Clojure we just have as functions. So Parkour contains the necessary plumbing to lift all that up so you do now just write functions. Uh, so this is the... Uh, our core version of the map and reduce functions uh, for the word count application that uh, we saw, basically the same thing that Sam Ritchie showed earlier. Uh, but so this version is, you know, this runs as a map reduce job, but it's just plain functions. No def special def mapper, no def reducer. Um, you write functions that then actually literally call the normal closure collection operations, actual map cat, actual map, to perform the work of that task. Now, in Java Hadoop, um, the classes serve two purposes. They hold the, you know, what you're executing, but they also have names so that you can find them when, you know, your code is suddenly thrown across the cluster. Um, in Parkour, um, we make this very nice one-to-one -one mapping so that where Hadoop wants a class, you can provide a var. And uh, this is very nice for multiple reasons. One, it's very, um, I think, very seamless because uh, there's this clear, like, named thing class, named thing var going on, but also it's completely obvious when you are transitioning from code that is running locally to code that's running remotely. Like you pass a var because it needs to be able to find that handle to run it remotely. There's no magic or confusion going on. 
Okay, so configuration steps. This is the one thing where parkour comes close to introducing a new abstraction. So in Hadoop, you have a lot of these like static methods or methods on the job class that do things to modify a job. And you just kind of like glue a bunch of them together in sequence and that sets up your job configuration. So what we do in parkour instead is we define a thing called a configuration step, which is pretty much literally just a function, like any function that takes one argument, which should be a job, and then it modifies it to apply parameters which are captured uh, through uh, local variables in a closure. What this does is it now means we have a uniform abstraction for describing things that we do to configure a job and lets us invert the control patterns so that we're able to pass bits of configuration around in order to build jobs as a composition of things instead of having to have one place that knows everything about what goes into a job. So then using that, this ability to describe a job as just a sequence of configuration steps, there's an API which lets you describe um, in a nice convenient functional DSL the composition of the steps to form a complete job. Um, it has helper functions for setting up all the stuff that you need for a complete job, input, mapper, partitioner, etc. cetera. Um, but then it has this nice big huge escape hatch where it's like, do anything you want to the job conf. Um, so anything, literally anything that is possible in raw Hadoop, you can do in parkour um, without uh, invoking any additional magic. Okay, so when I said that configuration steps were just functions earlier, I, I slightly lied. They're actually um, in my uh, current favorite trick. They're a protocol which is extended to IFN. Uh, so any function of one argument is a configuration step, but you can actually have additional kinds of configuration steps that have slightly different behavior. So where this is exploited in parkour is inputs and outputs. So a distributed sync is simply a function which configures a Hadoop job in order to output to a particular location using a particular output format. But it also has with it its tandem of how to read from that, uh, that location to configure a job to then consume that output that was just written. So when you execute a job, what it returns is this tandem, the dseq, distributed sequence, which then reads from that same location. Um, and then that is, again, what you pass here to the input. So if you have multiple jobs, you can actually just chain them together through composition because the output of a job is then the thing that you feed as the input to another job. But by reifying distributed sequences as their own thing, not just having them be purely these functions of uh, configuration steps, we're also able to give them additional behavior by allowing them us to reduce them locally. So here what we're doing is we're actually taking some collection of data that's on Hadoop and we're just applying closure reduced to it and then getting some local result. So you can apply exactly the same functions locally to do local operations on that data in your HGFS file system that you do in your MapReduce task when it runs remotely. And uh, I needed to close that parenthesis. I hope you all appreciate that. Okay, and uh, that was all I wanted to communicate, so thank you very much. Thanks, it'll take us a sec here to switch over. Uh, but next up is gonna be Steve Miner talking about the way to Eden. mentioned while we're getting set up tonight that uh, the party is uh, tonight. Um, so, and that is, the party is here. Uh, so anytime, I think after seven, you can show up and we'll start the trivia some, probably somewhere around 7.15 or whenever a quorum arrives. Uh, and that should be an hour plus, however long it takes to get to uh, uh, do that. And then we'll be showing sneakers after that. And there will be beverages and uh, good camaraderie and conversation. So please come in and have a good time. <laughs> Ready to go? You can use the podium mic if that'll work. All right. Hey. I'm Steve Miner. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for putting on a great conference um, and for giving me a few minutes to talk here about a uh, little project I've been working on. So, um, you know, 
closure community um, often likes to read old paper, academic papers and get their inspiration from uh, that old work. Um, I feel that way about science fiction, so I watch old sci-fi shows. In this case, uh, this is an old Star Trek episode, The Way to Eden. Now, these guys, to me, these guys look like closure programmers. <laughs> okay, they got the hair. I think that's, uh, that's the harmonic kit guitar there. <laughs> so, um, so they were, um, in this episode, they were, the space hippies were looking for Eden. And, um, you know, they wanted to communicate their values. So, um, so the Eden format was perfect for them. But, uh, and then there's a quote, you know, there's no schemas in the Eden format. That's a good thing, and Stuart Holloway talked to us uh, yesterday about that. But schemas are useful, and, uh, you know, we had a really good talk yesterday also about prismatic uh, schema. And um, I'm very interested in the schemas, too. So it's, uh, the hippies here are, are looking for a way um, to describe the shape of their data, all right? And they're trying to communicate with other people, and not everyone understands what's, what's going on with them. So this is, again, the, you know, the, the crew of the Enterprise is kind of uh, uh, confused about what these hippies are after, what, the, what they're talking about. Um, so my project's called Herbert. That comes from uh, an insult that the, the um, space hippies had for uh, Captain Kirk. But uh, Herbert was um, a minor official who was notorious for his rigid and limited patterns of thought. And so uh, that kinda, I kind of was inspired to own the insult there. And uh, I was designing a little schema language for Eden. So my goal was that I wanted to be whiteboard compatible. And I was really starting um, from a documentation point of view. I mean, I was trying to just document for myself what I was doing, you know, what keys I was using, what my data structures looked like. And I just wanted to have a, kind of a simple, terse, and uh, readable notation. So this is all in my humble opinion about what, what uh, is uh, simple and uh, easy to read. I also, once I got into this, I thought, well, we can make something executable as well and actually test it. And um, I kind of set up for myself a constraint that I wanted to do my expressions about Eden in Eden. So um, that's just a nice property. I don't know, something feels good when, when you can express your system in your own system. So I started with patterns. Um, so my schema language is kind of a pattern matching language. Um, the literals all match themselves, uh, like you'd expect. Symbols stand for something else. So that's, that's some way of uh, testing things. And I, I use you know, very short term. So it stands for integer, and KW for keyword, and so on. Um, maps, um, typically I had you know, literal keywords and then a value type for the, for, um, the corresponding value. Uh, vector notation was for any kind of sequence, so similar to destructuring. And then I added anything in a list is going to be some other kind of expression, some, some way of combining other patterns. And then the obvious kind of or, and, or not all work there. And I think this is fairly readable. At least you can kind of take a guess at what things are, are going to um, match there. We also added quantifiers. Um, so this is like regular expression quantifiers. Um, and they're typically in a list notation, but as a convenient shortcut, um, I allow symbols with um, a suffix of one of those quantifiers, and it means the same thing. And then this is my, my um, usual example, so I'm taking a map, um, and I'm specifying literal keywords and then um, types for the values. Um, the B in the middle there has a question mark at the end, that means that the B is optional. So if the B uh, keyword is in the map, then it has to be a symbol, the value has to be a symbol, but it might not be there at all. And then those are just um, some data values that would match that pattern. Okay, and then for more complicated patterns, I have a grammar, and uh, the idea is you can name kind of um, sub-patterns and uh, use those names as, uh, as patterns in your main pattern. So that's the first one. And the last form on this um, uh, slide here is uh, Eden describing itself in Eden. So that's, that, that's saying what a um, valid expression would be um, for this grammar form. So again, that's just a nice feeling that uh, things are expressible in Herbert that uh, I wanted to express. Um, we have a way of capturing some of the match in bindings, and then you can reuse those symbols um, to, to help with other constraints. Um, for uh, tags, you know, I didn't want to match exactly on classes, because I think that's a little 
I don't know, too brittle. And Eden has this nice idea of extending um, the notation using tags. So I adopted tags as my way of kind of doing the class match. I, we can do class matching as well, but this, the idea here is that if, um, if you say tag and then some symbol, we're going to match anything that would have printed, say, with that tag. Um, and you know, Clojure ha defines a few um, tags already for Eden. And like any of these date types all match to inst. And um, I added a convention for um, records. Um, so you can kind of go from the record class name into an appropriate tag. And there's another, um, um, another library called tag that's used for printing if you want to follow that convention. And um, at the base of it, there's a protocol. So you can, if you implement this protocol, any of your Java classes or special record classes can, can participate in this and match tags in uh, Herbert. So the API is pretty simple. There's one uh, convenience function, um, conforms, question mark, and give it a pattern and a value, and it just returns a Boolean. The, um, the second API call is conform with a pattern, and that returns a function that will do the, the match for you. And it's, with that function, a successful match actually returns a map of the binding. So if you have any, any bindings in your expression, you can extract those bits um, in the map, um, and then nil if it fails. So that's Herbert. Um, it's open source and it's on um, GitHub and on Clojars now, so you can take a look if you're interested. And um, I intend to make some changes after seeing that great talk about um, prismatic uh, schema. Um, I can already integrate with them. I, I hadn't heard about that you know, before about a month ago or so. But um, we can integrate as predicates, but I think um, they might be a good basis for doing my syntax on top of their stuff. And you know, I can kind of leverage a lot of what they've done. And I want to thank um, Eric Norman. I use his square peg um, uh, parser uh, library to um, implement uh, some of my tests and um, a few other things there. Um, and finally, thank you to Star Trek for uh, giving that episode and inspiring the name. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. I think it's, uh, uh, Alan, you're going to be up next. <laughs> um, I think it's really interesting how many talks we've had at the conference about uh, scheme, schemas, describing data, I should say. Let me put it that way. Uh, as someone who helped out with the talk selection and scheduling, uh, it was not obvious to me that that was a theme of the conference. So it's surprising how often there's a theme that is emergent. Alan is going to be talking about something called Gherkin. I assume everybody knows Alan Dipert. If not, this is Alan Dipert. <laughs> Everybody's heard of Gherkin as well? It's like a little pickle. <laughs> Everybody see okay? That's no, right. Nobody can hear okay. Okay, how are we doing? Yes. Do you use handheld or sure. Whatever's better. Okay. It's on. Hello. All right. Cool. So thanks everybody for coming and seeing my little thing about you don't know what yet. Um, so uh, we have this continual problem. Pretty much anybody who uses a computer has this issue where we're on Unix, and Unix gives us this thing called a shell. And um, you know, being a Linux user myself, I'm also kind of a part-time uh, Linux administrator, and at least as grumpy. So um, we have this issue. Um, Unix itself, you know, gives us powerful primitives to work with that we leverage usually through the JVM or C libraries. And it also gives us this less powerful and incredibly annoying abstraction called the shell, which is a kind of uh, disgusting non-language that's glued together from just garbage. So, but we use it all the time. It's everywhere. Um, you know, even our beautiful Clojure and Haskell programs are ultimately hypervised by some shell script somewhere. So, um, so what's in shell? Well, it has good stuff. I mean, obviously the, the syntax of shell is, is optimized for, for command line interactive usage. Um, which it's unfortunate, though, that there's nothing behind the syntax or in front of it. There's no way to extend the syntax. There's no way to access the primitives the syntax represents. 
So in terms of a programming language, it's, it's really horrible. But we often find ourselves in positions where we need to write small programs in Bash because we can't count on some dependency being there that we need, like the JVM or Clojure. So I, even in Clojure projects, you often see startup scripts or setup scripts or install scripts written in Bash, and uh, they're incredibly uh, brittle and, and error-prone, at least <laughs> any of the ones I've written. So how do we replace Bash? So I wrote a Lisp called Gherkin. It's a Lisp 1 uh, interpreter written in Bash 4. It's uh, on, on GitHub there. And um, this presentation software is actually written in Gherkin, so we're celebrating Gherkin right now. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what it is. What's in it? So it has string, integers, and symbol scalers. Um, they're all tagged types, and it could easily support big num or floating point. Um, at the bottom, everything is a string representation, so uh, you know, it's two string is actually probably faster than Java's. Just pointing that out. <laughs> um, so yeah, there, you know, we can do that kind of stuff by shelling out to BC. Unfortunately, subshelling in Bash is uh, very expensive because it, whenever you subshell or call a command in Bash, uh, it copies the environment over, which is uh, crap. Uh, so it has garbage collection, mark sweep uh, garbage collector, pretty vanilla there. It has dynamic binding facilities, similar to the way you create and update and do things with closure vars. It has a lexical binding facility with a fun special form uh, that does variatics, so you can, you know, you can build destructuring on top of this if you want, and I think we all want that. Uh, it has, you know, a non-stack re consuming recursion situation. Inside a fun primitive, you can call recur somewhere in tail position and not consume stack, so you can do uh, a form of TCO that way, the same way you can in closure with a loop. And it has, a, you know, the beginnings of a namespaces system. I think uh, for all you budding Gherkin programmers, we're going to want to have some kind of, uh, you know, way to share our code. Uh, I was thinking of like a, like, a, like a function you could type at the REPL to just ship off your whole world to gist or something. It's like, hey, check out my library and just, you know, it's, it's a lot of free love in the Gherkin world. So, um, things it will have. So it's got a, it has a def type construct in there. Um, it, it's weird. I, when I learned about def types and uh, protocols in Clojure, they seemed like an add-on thing. But since then, I realized, having used Clojure Script, that there's a tremendous value in having them at the bottom. And in fact, in Lisps like Emacs Lisp, which don't have um, uh, a way to create a user type, uh, it, that complexity works its way all the way to the garbage collector. And you'll, a lot of older Lisps have like separate heaps for the different types. And if you have this user type mechanism, then you don't need to do that kind of stuff. So it'll, it'll have macros that doesn't currently, but uh, it's pretty straightforward. And there'll even be first class, so you can have, like write a little anonymous macro. It's pretty sweet. Um, it'll have a core async-like stuff built on top of the stuff that Shell gives you, like FIFOs. A FIFO is really a blocking uh, uh, channel, and you can you can build CSP-like stuff on top of that, which we'll do. Um, and then it'll have uh, save world and load world. The entire state of the interpreter is in the Bash environment. So trivially, you can save your entire, you know, cons heap, Lisp interpreter state, everything loaded into a .sh file that you can then make executable. <laughs> so I have a, I have a vision for, um, you know, like I'm working on my little program, working, working, working. I do save world. It gives me a .sh file, and then I can send that to AMIs that are booting as a user data script. Um, I don't know if, because it's cool. Things that you might consider doing. I mean, you could write a closure interpreter for it. Uh, Spencer Tipping, who is this gentleman, he's not here, he's a factual guy, but uh, he wrote something similar for Bash that has actually a concurrent garbage collector, which I want to steal. Um, it would be a fun thing to do in Racket using their, their Lang extension facilities. Um, if I have aliases for closure syntax, we could actually statically type check, gradually type all the fancy type stuff, our Bash scripts, which is obviously value in that. Um, <laughs> And then uh, I realized the other day that make is kind of a delimited form of prolog. I mean, it unifies. So I figure we can have a, like a high performance embedded prolog that uses make. <laughs> there are some things, unfortunately, it can and will never have. Uh, it's impossible in Bash and any shell that I'm, actually ZSH has this, but in Bash and any POSIX shell, um, you can't have any kind of associative data. And you don't even have the primitive you need to do that, which is a random access array. So it'll never have a real array. It's only linked lists and bash environment variables. It'll never have any numeric performance whatsoever. <laughs> so it's not good for that. And really, it's not fast in any way. <laughs> but it will never, ever suck. 
So this is, you know, obviously built on a lot of prior art, back to John McCarthy, but uh, I think the number one uh, help was, uh, there's a guy, Darius Bacon, I think he has a really interesting GitHub repo, and uh, he revived an implementation of Lisp written for awk. It was actually on the Lisp mailing list in 1994. He did like a pretty cool update of it in 2001, and it was a good reference. Uh, Spencer Tipping, uh, he's like the most imaginative programmer you've never heard of. I really recommend typing his name into Google and, and uh, staying up all night reading his amazing stuff. He's got some cool stuff. Uh, Aaron Brooks, a coworker of mine, gave me some early feedback on the reader, uh, and Aaron, Griffiths, a uh, friend of Aaron, the other Aaron's who I've never met, gave me more feedback. And then Joel Martin, the other day, you know, I was sort of telling my coworkers about this, and, you know, nobody believed me at first. But then eventually they started helping. Joel Martin, um, he uh, taught me a little bit about read lines. So we have, you know, read line down here. So you can have history, which is actually better than the closure REPL was for a long time. So. Um, and then actually Joel Martin, I was like, well, you know, wouldn't it be cool if we could write web servers in Gherkin? But the problem is you can't bind to a socket and bash. So Joel Martin did something completely unexpected, which is he added that to bash and sent a patch to the... <laughs> so, you know, our platform is getting there. We're going to have pretty sweet. Uh, so yeah, I can do a little, I'm going to do a little uh, demo here. We're going to switch over to the REPL and I'll switch microphones. Okay, maybe I won't switch microphones, but I'll just go over a little code. Um, oh, thanks. Oh, wow, that's service. <laughs> okay, so there was a REPL over here, and that's the, the read line REPL, and you, know, you can type stuff in, like do stuff over here. That's cool. Um, but, you know, you can also run it in an inferior Lisp, and actually, uh, just to show off the, the startup time here, boop, GK REPL, boom, Lisping. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, you can evaluate some stuff, so you know, make some functions. You know, inks, you know, well, that's, that's true. And, you know, we have, you have functions with lexi lexical scopes, so you can do, you know, real, legit, and functional programming. Reduce plus zero, one, two, three. Ha! <laughs> uh, and then, you know, everything else you'd expect. So, you know, it has this, um, and of course, Jux, an, esen an essential, like, primitive. Um, <laughs> So yeah, that's the whole thing. It's on, uh, oh, so I guess a little bit if you want to contribute. Good luck to you. <laughs> so it's about a thousand lines of bash. I'm trying to keep it around a thousand lines. I, th I think that's, we can keep it there. Um, but you know, it's a lot of stuff. It just kind of keeps going. Uh, yeah, but it follows the pattern of, of awk lisp. So you know, how we uh, evaluate a special, how we evaluate a, a primitive and all that stuff. It is fairly split out. Um, I'd say 30% of the code is working around like just weird bash stuff. Like you can't have new line at the end of a bash, or you can't have white space at the end of a bash variable. It'll get truncated when you store that variable. So there are places where I have to like maintain sentinels. And of course the star is unreadable because it expands out to the like the current stuff in the current directory. So that was like a fun little thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's all out there. You know, have fun. Uh, I, hopefully the presentation serves as a little roadmap if you're interested in contributing. I mean, I definitely don't want to write, this would be the last big bash script I ever write, this, pro this thing. <laughs> so, um, you know, if we, can, if we can get it to a point where the interop story is good and it starts up reasonably quickly and it generally rules, then none of us will hopefully ever have to write bash scripts again. So let's, let's do that. Yeah.